because of the fact that um, although we're doing nuclear thermal rockets, um, we want to address the entire stage, uh, entire spacecraft system that would take payload to, to where we need to take it. And uh, one of the places that is the most advantageous for the nuclear thermal rocket, where, where it shows a lot of um, benefits, is, is the Mars mission. So we almost there? Okay, here, I'll hang on. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so it's our, our project is called the Nuclear Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, and we are under the Advanced Exploration Systems Program. The Advanced Exploration Systems Program uh, basically got started when NASA is transitioning from various established projects like the shuttle and, and Constellation, and all of a sudden those things go away. Well, we need to quickly transition, and, and, and it's not easy to transition very quickly, uh, manpower and resources. Uh, but one of the things that they can uh, to maintain competencies and keep up competencies and, and especially work on uh, useful technologies, they put it on technology programs. And one of the technology programs that is becoming uh, more important and more uh, in line with uh, uh, politically or um, things like that, that uh, is nuclear power uh, and nuclear thermal propulsion. So we're seeing a, a resurgence of uh, for nuclear power and, and, and rockets. Okay, uh, to talk about what, init what, what is happening now, uh, understand what was happening in the past, is uh, President J Kennedy uh, basically had, when he made his famous speech at Rice University, uh, to send men to moon and bring them back safely. He also uh, made a comment as well about, he said, secondly, accelerate development of the rover nuclear rocket. This gives promise of someday providing a means for even more exciting and ambitious exploration of space, perhaps beyond the moon, perhaps to the very end of the solar system itself. And he had a third point and a fourth point as well. But after 50 years, <clears throat> This is the only goal that President Kennedy had to establish that has not been fulfilled. Um, the prior investments and proven performance of the nuclear thermal rocket is uh, quite significant. Uh, there was a, the program was highly successful in that it, it developed a, an engine system that produced uh, cl close to 900 seconds ISP, a specific impulse, and uh, that that is two times better than any chemical rocket theoretically can do. And that is also just the beginning, the, just the beginning of uh, development, uh, the first, first level of uh, performance. You can improve upon that as you go. Um, you can, as you see here, they, they did, did a lot of different systems and uh, uh, different power levels. And you can see the actual time uh, that these r rockets were run. Um, there were facilities that was that was established back then. Uh, if you look in the picture down here below, you'll see a, a gentleman sitting right next to the uh, to the to the nuclear thermal uh, engine system that they were testing. And uh, if you think that you know, if you're concerned about radioactivity, before you run the engine, there is no radioactive uh, material involved. It's only after you run the engine that uh, the, the radioactive material is, is uh, generated. And uh, if you also, another point that I would like to make is that, you know, people think nuclear thermal rockets is, is inherently dangerous uh, because of the fact that it's nuclear and we have nuclear bombs and things. Um, we have Stan Gunn, who was involved with just about all of this testing back in the 60s, and I'm convinced that he's alive today because of the radiation that he experienced uh, during that time. 
Yeah. We're going to test him for X-Men powers later. <clears throat> but it really isn't as dangerous as people think. Stan was telling me a story about how he wanted to look into the reactor uh, after it was run. And they gave him a 30-second window to look in. And after that, uh, they checked his uh, badge. And they couldn't read it because it was overexposed. But he didn't, he's, he's 90 now, and he's uh, still uh, very, very active and very um, involved with the, with the nuclear thermal rocket activities. Okay, um, here we have uh, a little bit of the history of the rover NERVA program where we did most of the testing. Uh, since then, we've done a lot of studies. Um, uh, the Rover Nerva program, uh, there was an investment of approximately $1.4 billion over a 15-year period. Uh, they did a lot of work on fuel, fuel development, and engine system development. And you, you I wish I could point it out better, um, but uh, they did a lot of testing, a lot of testing. And since then, we haven't done much testing. We've done a lot of studies. Uh, we did do a little bit of um, testing with the particle bed experiment with the Air Force, and uh, that showed some um, promise, but uh, there were some inherent problems with some instabilities, uh, although they could probably fix that if, if they were allowed to continue. But all, all through the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, oh, thank you, um, all through the 70s, 80s, and the 90s, we, we basically did little studies and uh, Come around 2005, um, we, we were allowed to uh, do um, some more nuclear power uh, studies. And then Constellation came into place. And at that time, uh, because of the big programs needing more resources and focus on what was already there, uh, we, that project got cut very quickly. But now that uh, those have been canceled and now a technology program can, can kind of jump in its place, we, we have a three-year program uh, under this project uh, at approximately three, $3 million per year. And it's mostly, um, mostly in, in the dollars of uh, manpower. Uh, we do have a little bit of procurement dollars, and we're focusing that on the fuels development because uh, the fuel is the most important element or the most long lead item to develop. Um, you'll also see that here that the Russians did quite a bit of development, and uh, that's a, a kind of a funny situation is when our program was cut in uh, 73, um, the Russians thought that we went black that we were doing this research. And so they actually invested more money to, to keep up with us when we, didn't, we weren't doing anything. They thought we were doing a lot. Okay, okay. well, let me get into the nuclear thermal rocket. Um, basically, you have uh, the fuel, which uh, we use the liquid hydrogen. Uh, it goes through the pump. We, we force the propellant through the, the aft skirt of the engine. Uh, it, it picks up heat and it's able to drive the turbo pumps. We have a dual pu turbo pump system, um, and uh, we take that warmed up fuel and pump system through the reactor, and the reactor is, a, is a, basically a heat exchanger. There's no chemical reaction uh, driving this uh, engine. Uh, basically heating the liquid hydrogen to high temperatures and expelling it out the nozzle, and that gives us uh, the, in the amount of thrust that we need. The specific impulse for a uh, LOX hydrogen engine, a chemical engine, the highest uh, theoretical um, capability of that is a 460 seconds. Now, nuclear thermal propulsion uh, rocket uh, can, we've proven back in the, the rover days that we can get 850, and with a little bit more uh, work, we can probably fairly easily get it to 900 seconds. Uh, thrust to weight, this is where the chemical rocket has an advantage over nuclear, um, but depending on how we design the nuclear rocket uh, and the amount of shielding that might be needed, this can be improved as well. The exhaust temperature is uh, significantly higher for the LOX hydrogen uh, engine because of the chemical reaction, but um, uh, th this uh, temperature uh, for the nuclear thermal propulsion rocket is uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, manageable. Um, the benefits is it reduces launch mass and has the potential to reduce trip times to Mars. 
Um, it has the twice, I mentioned before, the twice the specific impulse of chemical propulsion. It increases emission launch opportunities uh, because it can take, because of the, the extra amount of delta V that it can produce with less uh, propellant, uh, we have uh, more opportunities that we can go to uh, Mars accounting for you know, a favorable orbits uh, and declinations of Mars. Uh, it leverages chemical rocket experience. We got turbo pumps that's uh, been, uh, we, we have extensive knowledge of, and it's uh, scalable. No combustion instability since there is no combustion, uh, but we can get vibration through the flows, but, and that, but that can be accounted for uh, through the design. The challenges are uh, we need to recapture the nuclear fuel element development. Um, as I me mentioned before earlier uh, when I presented, uh, more specifically on the fuel development, um, that's something we need to, to relearn, uh, although we have a fairly good documentation. Um, the near-Earth operation of uh, the powered uh, spacecraft, we, we definitely don't want a powered nuclear rocket coming back into the Earth. Um, we have ground test facilities that we have from the past, but we need to refurbish or redevelop because they're, they haven't been used or they've been taken apart. Um, human rating qualifications, uh, the launch volume of uh, liquid hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen takes up a lot of volume, but it's low mass. Uh, we have to account for that in the launch uh, capabilities. And then cryogenic fluid management, we have to keep the liquid hydrogen cold, and that's a, that's a huge challenge, especially when we're going to Mars where the mission could be um, uh, over a year long. All right. Um, here you can see the, the chart that uh, shows uh, that for a mission to Mars you, with a nuclear rocket, you need significantly less propellant uh, and it uses much less uh, uh, payload um, or mass capability to, to low Earth orbit. Uh, you can see it's almost two times the amount that's necessary or, or com in comparison. Um, also, when you look here, he, here is uh, where, for this study, uh, inertial mass to low Earth orbit, this is the, the upper limit of what, what might be possible to do with the system that they uh, did this analysis. But when you compare the chemical propulsion versus the thermal or nuclear thermal propulsion, it's, um, we have a lot more, uh, op we can basically account for all the opportunities in this 15-year cycle where uh, the chemical propulsion will only allow us to fly one opportunity out of the 15-year cycle that we have uh, for uh, Mars opportunities. All right, here, here's a study that was done. Uh, this, is, this would be one of those big uh, complicated missions that Mr. Zubrin wouldn't like. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, if you look, uh, nuclear thermal propulsion would require significantly less uh, launches to get the payload and the propellant up into orbit. And if you look at the, the cost difference of, of this uh, launch system that they were looking at, and this was done a while ago, uh, this was 80 metric ton per launch um, rockets, uh, just one mission to Mars would pay for itself. Uh, pay for the development of the nuclear thermal rocket. And uh, going on, um, this is a, a chart that basically shows that uh, nuclear reactors can, can, the benefit of the nuclear reactor is that it, it can provide power for a long duration and significantly high power rates. Uh, the thing is still, there is a limitation. We have to have propellant um, to, to drive the, the rocket. Um, after the propellant is used, we could still have significant am amount of power in the nuclear reactors, and uh, and we we are looking at reusability. Although, if we're going to use uh, reuse these uh, nuclear thermal rockets, we still need to get propellant in space uh, to be able to uh, utilize that power. Okay, going base basically to the. Um, Work breakdown structure of the nuclear cryogenic propulsion stage. We have, um, it, it's, we've got involvement from Glenn Research Center and uh, JSC as well. 
Uh, we have DOE participating, um, but it's being led out at Marshall, and we have a, a basic uh, preconceptual design of the nuclear cryogenic propulsion stage and architecture integration work. That's I'm leading that effort. Um, we have a high power nuclear thermal rocket in element environment simulator that uh, Bill Emmerich is leading. Um, I've talked about the fuel design and fabrication activity. I, I won't cover that very much uh, today. And then uh, uh, this is basically testing the, the fuels in, in the uh, simulator. And then we have to address the affordability and the feasibility of the nuclear cryogenic propulsion stage, and, and I'll talk about that as well. And then we have a small effort uh, looking at second generation concepts. Okay, uh, mission architectures. Uh, nuclear propulsion can be utilized for uh, lunar, uh, near Earth orbit, Lagrange points, uh, Phobos missions, and Mars cargo and human missions. Um, where nuclear propulsion really shines is, is uh, is here in the Mars cargo and human missions and beyond. This, that's where you can really see the benefits. Um, here is a, uh, a representative mission, uh, and this is basically um, the DRM-5 that was back done, done back in the Constellation period, and uh, we have uh, a four launch opportunity in line configuration. Uh, we would have a six crew member. The payload that's required to be in, inserted into low Earth orbit is around 356 uh, metric tons. Um, it would require um, basically four launches. Um, the first burn, it would require four total burns, uh, three restarts. And the first burn would be approximately 84 minutes. Uh, total burn time would be approximately one and a half to two hours. Uh, so we have to design the, the fuel element to be able to handle that, those kinds of conditions. But this is kind of a representative mission that, that we are looking at. We are also looking at what can be possible with a, a simple mission, uh, one launch system that could prove out the nuclear thermal rocket. Um, and uh, I guess, I need to mention the, the United States National Space Policy, as of 2010, specifies that NASA will, by 2025, 20, begin crewed missions beyond the moon, uh, including sending humans to an asteroid. By the mid-2030s, send the humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And uh, that, that is, I'm sure, very unsatisfactory for most of the, uh, the people here. And um, hopefully this can change, but Unfortunately, this is where we are working to right now, and and my architecture uh, work has to fit within the constraints that are provided. And uh, the SLS launch opportunities are uh, very minimal. There's still uh, a gap, uh, a mismatch uh, of how many launches and how often they can go up to provide a four-launch uh, uh, vehicle opportunity to Mars, uh, that's, a, that's a huge challenge and there's, there's a discrepancy there. Uh, in that element, we're working on the modeling of, of the nuclear thermal reactor as, uh, and, and here you see a model of um, how uh, we account for the reactivity of the elements and uh, a, a little bit of knowledge about how we control the reactivity. Here we have a, a drum that rotates and uh, basically, when the drum rotates around this way, the, the, the poison uh, basically re receives all the neutrons um, and will not allow the, the reactivity to occur. But if you have it in this position, and we have a, a neutron initiator, uh, that will start the nuclear activity and basically start that nuclear reaction to provide the power. Um, all right, and we also have uh, the the uh, engine system modeling uh, that we're trying to combine together with the nuclear uh, models where it makes sense. Uh, so that with the models, if we can uh, get it tied down to uh, uh, various test data, uh, we'll be able to um, hopefully save on testing and, and reduce some of that cost. Uh, all right, going to the, the 
nuclear thermal rocket element environment simulator. Uh, basically, what it does is tests out the fuel elements in an environment that it's going to experience in the nuclear thermal rocket, minus uh, the radiation. Uh, to do that, we use inductive heaters to simulate the heat. And um, <clears throat> basically, in this uh, simulator, we should be able to uh, test el fuel elements as well as a, a set of elements around uh, the tie tubes. Um, here you see the basic uh, system, the pressure vessel where the, uh, the fuel element will reside. The hydrogen flows this way, um, and we'll be testing out those fuel elements to the temperatures and, and as best as we can. And uh, right now, this, is, this system is being upgraded uh, is to, so that we can uh, provide more power and te test it to higher temperatures. And uh, um, it's, uh, it should be ready for us uh, next year. Okay, I talked a little bit about the fuel element fabrication activity. Here, uh, the graphite and the graphite composites, those were developed during the rover Nerva days. Cermets are a little bit um, behind on technology compared to the composites, but uh, they can function at a higher temperature. And as, as the, it increases in higher temperature, the ISP increases. Here we have the carbides, uh, tricarbides, and the uh, binary carbides, which the Russians have, have developed and could, could show significant improvement. And, and all, these, all of these items could be uh, tested in that uh, simulator. Okay, going to the affordable strategy, um, affordable development and qualification strategy. Here is a, a, a notional uh, NTP development plan, as, as you can see, it goes, it can span a significant amount of years. And it's, um, it's kind of sad to go back in history and look at all the, the studies that have been done. Uh, I've seen these uh, development plans, development schedules starting in, you know, 2000 or 1995. And then we were supposed to have something ready by uh, 2005. Or we have, uh, it's starting in 2000, and we're supposed to have the system all ready and to go right now. Uh, but as you know, all of those programs have been canceled, and we've had to start over. And, and that's, uh, that, that's discouraging. Um, but we are starting again, and we are focusing on the fuel element development right now. And uh, that, that is... Uh, the mo longest lead item, and that's where we're focused in on. Um, of course, uh, if we were to get started on full-scale development, the, the environmental, environmental impact statement for uh, the, the, the facility as well as the project, uh, that takes a significant amount of work to get ready, and it has to be addressed for the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. Okay, um, here's some in engine development history. Um, I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll just summarize real quick. We, we know some uh, development costs of uh, engines, chemical engines. Nuclear thermal rockets shouldn't cost that much more. And just recently, we did a J2X development uh, at current year dollars, and it was approximately 2.8 billion. And, uh, and when, when just recently we did a bottoms-up cost estimate for the nuclear thermal rocket, it was approximately $3, three billion to do a full-scale development and provide uh, a rocket ready for a mission. Um, here's some facilities that uh, have been used in the past for the Rover Nerva program, and unfortunately, a lot of these have been disassembled and destroyed, um, and we're losing these capabilities uh, as we speak. Um, we're going to have to redevelop those if we're going to uh, develop the nuclear thermal rocket. Um, we're also looking at a demo flight. You know, what size engine is appropriate? Do we do, we do a full-scale development? and test a uh, full-scale engine and run it derated, or do we make a small one that can be uh, scalable? Uh, those are all challenges. Um, but if we do a demo flight and we need to inspect it in orbit, 
uh, we, we have various technologies that are improving right now to support that activity. And then here we have the second generation uh, nuclear concepts work. Um, th this is uh, a very low level of effort and uh, here is a solid core nuclear rocket. Basically uh, this is what we're developing right now. Uh, as we go further into the future we could uh, look at liquid core nuclear rocket that allows the, the temperature of the uh, of the propellant to be uh, heated up to a much higher temperatures, therefore providing greater ISP. Uh, we can even in the future uh, look at open cycle gas core nuclear thermal rockets and uh, those are much more advanced technologies of course, but uh, we, they, they were able to simulate this in a manner where um, you could keep the gas core of uranium uh, and have the system working. Unfortunately, the moment uh, you got thrust in it, the, the uranium would expel out the, the end and, and you'd no longer have the fuel. So anyways, I uh, apologize for taking so long. Uh, and um, uh, we're working the space nuclear power and propulsion are game-changing technologies for space exploration. And uh, we have a three-year project that can uh, demonstrate the viability and affordability of the nuclear cryogenic propulsion stage and make it make nuclear propulsion more more relevant. Uh, we're looking for partnerships and collaborations if uh, if international uh, collaborations will allow this to keep going we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, actively pursuing those and certainly participation is encouraged and uh, if you need to contact us or and have ideas uh, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. I'm really sorry. I think I ran over time, and I, I don't think there's time for questions. But <laughs> just come on up if you have any questions. Yeah, if, if you're okay with it, uh, if you're okay with it, uh, um, we, you can take questions just outside in the hall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can meet um, and Mr. Kim, right? Yeah. So you can meet Mr. Kim outside in the hall if you have questions. Um, the next. Uh,